Many people in our food community have been seriously impacted by Superstorm Sandy, and our hearts go out to them. At HRN, we've been covering these stories since the storm hit. To learn more, visit our website at www.heritageradionetwork.org. Today's program has been brought to you by TechServe, New York's original and still the best Apple computer, iPod, and iPhone store and repair shop. For more information, visit TechServe.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. We talk about food. We talk about music. With musical dudes. Finger on the pulse. Snacky tunes. That was just Conveyor with Wool Gatherer. They will be playing live later today. Uh, 
Welcome to Snacky Tunes. I am one half your host, Greg Bresnitz. Uh, Darren Bresnitz is on his hiatus. Uh, what up, dude? And Joe, our dog. Um, it's been a few weeks since we have been here. Um, you know, we want to take a moment and send out our thoughts and prayers to everyone that's been affected by and still affected by Sandy. Um, we in Brooklyn were, or at least in Bushwick, uh, Williamsburg, were relatively lucky, um, but that does not mean that. We are nowhere uh, any less um, saddened by what's happened and um, continuing our efforts through the station and some fundraisers that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, please go out and volunteer. Please go and check out how you can go help. Um, this is one of those things that doesn't go away and takes a long, long time to recover. Um, so even if you think a month after that your efforts aren't uh, necessary, it will still very much help. So please, please, please uh, help. Um, as I said, Conveyor will be on later today. But right now we have Matt Burns from the Brooklyn Salsa Company. Uh, welcome to Snacky Tunes. Thanks. Glad uh, to be here. I was, you know, almost guzzling. I, I, I'm staring at, you know, seven variety, var- varieties of salsa, and um, they're all really good. But before we get into the, you know, the salsa at hand, why don't you take us back to the beginning of how Brooklyn Salsa Company came to be? Yeah, so we started in Bushwick. Um, it was the early summer of 2008, and my business partner Rob Banky and I we we lived together in an uh, in a converted opera house. It was like an artist loft building, and and uh, we were making salsa and and throwing shows in our basement and just kind of a part of the music scene. And it really started from uh, our desire to just eat good food, see great music and uh, participate in, in the Brooklyn community somehow. So we had a close friend who was like, you guys should start a salsa company, and Rob's the one with the MBA, and I come from the creative background. I worked in a, in a little Mexican taqueria in my home state in South Dakota when I was a teenager and learned how to make salsa and fried chips and, you know, great cheese and make taquitos and this kind of thing. So I just kept doing it for a long, long time. And a close friend was like, you guys should start a salsa company, and we looked at each other and we're like, actually... We should do that. I like how you put grating cheese on the same level as making salsa. Yeah. It's like I would put them at different skill sets. That's just me. Sure, that's just sure. Me. Yeah, well, in the back of a in the back of a Mexican restaurant, it's like get these things done. Right, free chips and salsa for every table. Right. Um. So you guys started that, and what was the um? What was the first flavor? I'd say the first flavor was the pure because it all started with just um. You know, those simple ingredients, tomato, onion, cilantro, lime, jalapeno, and that's really what the pure is. It's, it's uh, I don't want to say it's traditional, but it's the, maybe the most common salsa flavor that, that you would taste out of our line. And how do you start peddling salsa? So we started peddling salsa uh, first on our bikes. We, we were doing... <laughs> literally. Literally, literally peddling, peddling it on our bikes. bikes. Yeah, we, we, we bought a chip fryer. And we would go around the neighborhood and pick up ingredients from these, like, you know, Dominican food distributors and grocery stores and stuff and bring it home and make and try to figure out our ingredients. And we, you know, we basically were like, well, let's start a taco delivery service first. And it was a late night kind of phone number only uh, experience where people could just dial up our number. We'd make a couple tacos and then we'd send our friends out to deliver them. And that's how we got the word out about the Brooklyn Sauce Company first that we were doing it. And it took us about a year before we were able to um, get it in the jar and, and out to some stores. How were how are you um, how are you sending it out before? Like, what was the packaging? Well, there. Well, first we had a biodegradable, like um, you know, a corn-based little you know plastic Tupperware kind of a thing that that we did, and it was all fresh salsa in the beginning. And the salsa you eat today in the jars, those are the fresh recipes that now have to be heated, you know, pasteurized and sealed into a jar. Um, and when we were doing the taco delivery service, you could order a vegan taco, but your choice was the salsa flavor. So say you want, I'm going to get the tropical, and it would be the same taco for every one, um, but you would choose your salsa. So the, the taco really was just more like a vessel for your condiment. Exactly. Um, and so, and I mean, you were vegan. Yeah, 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 and, yeah, for um, a long time. Which is, you know, really amazing that, but, you know, I feel like we've always contended on this show that meat is amazing and, and don't get us wrong, but coaxing flavors out of uh, vegetables mm-hmm. is like a whole other world. Um, we had a kaijutsu this past weekend, which 
is like one of the best vegetarian, almost I would say vegan restaurants I've ever eaten at just like ancient art of just cooking flavors out of vegetables. And all of the stuff here is so flavorful. And it's all vegan, yeah. It just kind of slaps you across the tongue. That was something that we wanted from the very beginning. We wanted a full vegan line. We never talked about a cheese dipper, you know, expanding into anything strange. We want to play with vegetables and their flavors. And a lot of what we do is using fresh lime juice to bring out the elements. And that's that's Mexican food, period. Just a lot of lime juice uh, and, you know, ingredients like cilantro, sea salt, things like this that, that make flavors pop. You know, one of the uh, difficulties, I think, for a lot of Brooklyn Bushwick companies is, you know, they get to this kind of level of, you know, they reach I- local iconic status, but then it's sometimes hard to cross over. How did you get out from, like, the Brooklyn Bushwick area and kind of expand to, which is now a national chain? Yeah. Um, it's really a good question because it, it's something that's facing a lot of uh, of the members of this, you know, Brooklyn food movement is how do you how do you take your idea this thing you love to make in your kitchen, maybe a recipe that your mom had or, you know, an idea that you've got with your friends. How do you take it to the next level? Um, and for us, we, after we went through our, you know, preparation stage, how are we going to do this, you know, using Google, trying to figure out, okay, how do we put it in a jar? How do we seal the jar? What kind of preservation is needed? Well, luckily for us, we found out it was just lime juice. But then it was, okay, how do we make this and get it out there and hustle it? And so in the very beginning, it was just us in the kitchen making it, blending it, and then we would do it at shows and stuff, but we knew that we couldn't sell that product into grocery stores. So when the, we went to um, you know kind of more mass production where we would do a lot at one time. Like I think the very first time we made uh, our salsa in a jar, we made a thousand jars of each flavor because we wanted to concentrate our efforts so that we just focus on one flavor, make as much as we could of each one, and then once we had it, head out store by store, say, hey, we're, we're in the neighborhood. Um, but how did you get into store? I mean, did you, you proved that it was pasteurized and that it was safe and considered on the shelf? Exactly. Well, things like, you know, the nutritional information on the side of a jar. Well, how do you do that? Where do you get that? We worked with Cornell University. and um, How did you approach them? We just called them up. And they've got they've got a food research lab there that uh, can do a lot of those early things, you know, understanding what your pH level is, what does it take to seal it, what are the steps. It's called a scheduled process that you need. And that is um, kind of the scientific formulation of how you make the recipe that you would do at home into a shelf-stable um, packaged something that you could sell out into the market. Is, did you have to pay them or is it, did you work with students? Or? Yeah, you well, you do pay them. Um, do you mind sharing how much it is? Uh, it's only a couple hundred dollars. It's not bad. Really? Oh. Yeah. You, it's not like you don't have to pay them $10,000 to get this information. So it's not that difficult to go from something that's successful in your kitchen to coming up with a recipe that you could produce and mass and a mass scale. Yeah. It's not difficult to do that at all. What's difficult then is to assemble the ingredients to really start selling it. So for instance, a lot of the the food vendors who get started you know, at a place like the Brooklyn Flea or or uh, smorgasburg or anywhere else that, that people are starting to sell their own condiments on a week by week basis. If you can do it out of a commercial kitchen, you know, you can rent those for 40 bucks an hour and you can, you can really make some stuff, but then how do you take it to that next level where you sell it into stores? Well, you have to figure out a way to make a lot more, uh, in a more concentrated amount of time. So if you focus on one thing for a weekend, you know, for two days straight and make as many as you can, and then you have 500, you know, jars of salsa, then you start to say, well, all right, for us, our salsa is good for about two years. Um, so we have that amount of time to go out and find ways to sell it. So starting to talk to distributors. But really, you know, when you're getting started for us, it was store by store, talking to the manager, saying we'll drop it off ourselves. Uh, and for, I think, the first, you know, almost, I mean, we've been a company for two and a half years now selling our salsa, but for the first over a year and a half, every single store that sold us was us driving and, it there. And how did you find distribution? Well, partially we reached out, um, you know, we knew we wanted to get into distribution networks so that it could spread, and we knew that we weren't going to be able to take it really outside of the city on our own. And at the same time, just by setting us up uh, at flea markets and things, people started to hear about it, getting early press, you know, and so some contacted us, we contacted some, and now it's a constant game of, of... well, how do we continue to expand our reach? 
Uh, all right, well, let's take a quick musical break, and then we're going to talk about some of the flavors, including the two new ones, um, Salsa Power, Lifestyle, Micheladas, uh, and all things uh, Brooklyn Salsa Company. Uh, I just want to let you know that tomorrow is the release of the third Snacky Tunes live comp, which you'll be able to get for free. You can head to the Heritage Radio Network. Dot org or fotpnyc.com tomorrow the link will be live it'll be a free download and tomorrow night we are hosting a uh, hurricane uh, benefit party over at cameo um, all the thing all the money and proceeds will go to the red hook initiative 10 um, percent in the bar as well so drink up it's at cameo gallery on north six and white we're gonna have live performances from erica spring moon hooch x cops uh, and DJ sets by Rewards and Computer Magic. All those bands uh, are on the comp. Doors are at 7, first band at 8. Um, it's $5 donation suggested. You can, of course, give more or just show up and drink. Uh, and uh, we really hope to see you all out there. Um, and this is a track that's going to be on the comp from the Spring Standards. Uh, you are listening to Snacky Tunes. <laughs> standards uh live on snacky tunes snacky tunes volume three out tomorrow if you want to hear the first two volumes they're up on the heritage radio network soundcloud just google heritage radio network soundcloud snacky tunes you'll find it really really proud of uh this comp uh on the show we are back with matt burns 
from the Brooklyn Salsa Company. Um, trying to figure out how to not overdose on all of these uh, salsas and, and pizza sauce. and salad. But um, what I'm really excited about is your brand new mole sauce because mole is amazing. Let's just let's just put that as a statement. Yes, mole it, is it amazing. A statement. Um, if, if you haven't tried it, you got to get into it. Just mole at any of your local. Mexican yeah. restaurants, try it. And don't get freaked out by it. it's like 27 ingredients and pumpkins and all mm-hmm. and chocolate. All just blends mm-hmm. together to like a... It's mm. actually the original salsa mole. You know, oh, like, know for instance, guacamole. You know, oh. it's mashed ingredients, mashed vegetables. And from mole, which is, you know, an ancient uh, condiment, ultimately stew of as many ingredients as you can find. Um, how do you put that then on meats, on vegetables? But let's let's talk about yours because I want to reiterate the fact that all of your salsas are vegan. Yeah. Which is awesome. Um, and then no less uh, amazing and just incredible flavors. But your mole is what you were saying, one of the first moles that's actually packaged in a jar. Exactly. It's one of, well, definitely in the States, this is the first vegan mole and the first one, um, you know, to be out there on a, on a grocery store s- shelf along with salsa, which it is. And... Uh, Traditionally, mole is made with a stock, you know, whether that's a chicken stock or beef stock, um, cooking bones for a long, long time to get some type of a base and then adding the chilies and the vegetables and tomatoes in afterwards. And I thought, well, how are we going to do this? And and then it became more about the coffee, more about the chocolate, more about, um, you know, the dark ingredients that we could use to, to give that black, thick, sweet substance using agave nectar to sweeten it up instead of cane sugar and um, so yeah, now we've got, now we've got a, a vegan, uh, mole negro. Uh, it's delicious. I'm actually just kind of creeping on the ingredient list because, oh, it's, yeah. uh, do you, A, do you have enough label for it? I don't think so. Yeah. It's right over here. I Boom mean, on the side. That's so, I mean, it's actually not that, oh no, not 27. Not 27 <laughs> ingredients. They say, I think, I think it's like 11 or 13 ingredients is considered a mole. And the, the big one there is the spices that come in afterwards. For us, using black pepper, turmeric, nutmeg, cardamom. You have so much on there. It's vegan, gluten-free. It's mm-hmm. awesome. But it's also conscious methods, which I think is one of like your hallmarks of your yes. company. If you want to, Let's talk about that. Where did that come from? Conscious methods, um, direct trade, local source, organic farmers. It came from our desire to um, create a company that operates with integrity, even while growing. We knew that we wanted to grow larger than just New York City. So how do we do that? How do we create a brand that can can be in California just as much as it can be in New York City um, and not not just use one thing? For instance, a lot of companies these days, they do certified organic. Well, we chose that we wouldn't do certified organic. We chose that we were going to do some organic, some local, direct trade, and work within those mm-hmm. confines. So um, we work – our main farm – is in Milton, New York. It's called Hepworth Farms. They're a seventh generation farm. Shout out. Shout out. What's up? We love you. Um, and the women that operate this farm, they're doing it right. From the very, very beginning, we help with the seed selection, heirloom seeds, you know, the catalog every year. What kind of new exciting things can we use? And so just like the mixture of the heirloom tomatoes that go into our products, you know, we there's 500 different varietals of tomatoes that go into these products and it's different really every time we make it maybe more green tomatoes maybe more orange maybe more black um now do you do you feel going this way this conscious method has slowed down growth for you guys and it's taken a little bit longer or do you think that you're right on pace even if you had gone you know the more conventional you know just en masse you know but like bio upgraded tomatoes sure it it's a it's I think we're right on track for for how we've been doing it. Of course, we could have done a lot more, a lot cheaper, right? You know, if we were using just tomatoes from China, of course. And even with like organic products, there's always I can get mechanized California grown tomatoes that are sprayed with an organic compound that turn all the tomatoes red at the same time, and then have those sent out mashed, whatever. And it, it would still be a lot cheaper. But using fresh ingredients, yeah. I, I guess where we are, we're right on track for our own growth. And the best part about it is, you know, we're not, it's not a race. No. 
we're doing it because we love it and and it's it's fun to be involved with and using fresh ingredients too is is another one of those difficult challenges because other sauces out there that we compete with they use dehydrated ingredients dehydrated onions dehydrated garlic things like this that they just add I mean, water but you can, you can taste this i mean I, and yeah. i'm not just saying that because you're singing in front of me but you can literally taste it does feel like someone just like mixed this up and like oh i just made some salsa this weekend like yes. and it, it tastes like that in a jar but you know, I could also see that you would use this just not in chips and salsa, but, like, for c- other cooking methods. Totally. Like, I see, like, maybe not that, but, like, the the queen one and the hot one and, you know, your new, um, your butterscotch, butternut puree. Yeah, the butternut squash. It's called the harvest. So, I'll take you through the line just a little bit here. We've got, you know, from mild to hot, the green, the pure, the tropical, the curry, the hot. Our new sixth flavor, the mole, which you're going to see more and more of. And then a seasonal, which we've brought back the harvest, which is the butternut squash, coconut milk, cinnamon. I mean, I just see throwing some rice in this or some noodles or anything totally. like that. Because it's not, I mean, for those who are not, have not had it, it's not chunky. It's a puree. Mm-hmm. So it really, it's like not like you're dealing with all the other, which is good. It, well, we call it taqueria style. It's it's a smooth blend, which is the way it would be done in a, in a you know, downtown Mexico City little local shop, they'd throw their fresh ingredients in a blender, whip them up, take them out. And all these recipes, like I said, these are our fresh recipes, just jarred. Gotcha. Um, so final question is, you know, what's next for you guys? Like what's on the, the horizon? Well, next summer we're going to bring out a chunky line. Oh. People have been asking for it and uh, we're thinking, yeah, now's the, the Brooklyn, time. The Brooklynites demand it. Totally. So we're calling that the chunk and it's going to be a line of, of um, uh, I think we'll probably start with three of them and bring those out in the spring and see what people want. And we've just started selling our salsas into the Barclays Center in the VIP suites out there. So if uh, you're, ever, you're ever out partying with Jay-Z and, and the NBA crew, get some BK salsa at That's the Barclays pretty, Center. How did that too. happen? It just they, They're doing it right over there. They're bringing in local food companies. That's amazing. And I, I bet the fact that you have Brooklyn in the name doesn't hurt because they're like all things Brooklyn. Exactly. Um, all right. Well, do you want to give us the nuts and bolts where people can find you, where they can find their local retailer? Totally. We're, we're sold in Whole Foods. We're sold on Fresh Direct if you like to do your groceries that way. Citarella, D'Agostino's, Fairway Market. Um, a lot of the, the you know local smaller stores, you can, you can find us in a great many places. Amazing. And website? BKSalsa.com. We're on Twitter and Instagram at BKSalsa. Awesome. Take the lid off there. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, we have a couple more tracks from the Snacky Tunes Live Volume 3 comp. This uh, is Reggie Watts, followed up by Wallpaper, who you all know wrote our theme song. Comp is out tomorrow. Release and Hurricane uh, Benefit tomorrow for Red Hook Initiative at Cameo Gallery. Uh, this is Reggie Watts with uh, the track Internet Radio. This is a song that I did a long time ago. And this is about people who have a difficult time adjusting to where they could go and where they could be. So, without further ado, I think I would like to take a chance to do this. Hey. Yeah, what's up? I was just wondering, could you come? Yeah, please turn off the reverb. Okay, here we go. Stealing a 
this way across the foreign land You gotta realize what could be going on, yes To give yourself a little bit of chance, no, yeah People trying to make it all work all night going in. But if I do the worst and make things better, isn't the negative just as important as positivity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you wanna take anything, don't know what, yeah. If you wanna take anything, don't know what, yeah. If you wanna take Sitting on a plate with a knife What you gonna do when you get married your wife She always staring at you with those googly eyes But never would you do it if you had to despise Who you was in the first place Listen, you gotta learn to accept the grace Of the beauty of the way you wanna do And the thing that you see You gotta put yourself down upon one knee And tell yourself what you really doing this for Is it societal pressure, whatever, you a whore Listen, I got this up on the switch You gotta do anything Feel tough and shit, but you would never do this. Yo, yeah, come on. Uh, 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 yeah, put them the radio, radio. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, put your info on the info. Uh, 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 internet radio, uh, internet radio, radio, internet radio. What you gonna, what you gonna, what, 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 you wanna take anything, don't know why, yeah. All right, we're just gonna fade that out because uh, we have conveyor in here, and I feel like uh, we got a lot to talk about. Um, welcome to the show, welcome to Snacky Tunes. Thank you. Uh, you're gonna start off with a story. Why don't we start with the story? Yeah. So, Evan has a bad back, and every now and then he'll go into these um, those Chinese massage parlors that you'll see on the sort of um, basement-type underground buildings where it's like foot and back rub, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and he goes, and what's, this, what's the setup normally there? You know, it's uh, usually maybe 5 to 10 rooms, depending on the size of the place, um, maybe five employees there, you know, naturally. And really bad music, um, usually instrumental flute-driven versions of popular <laughs> songs, like Simon and Garfunkel songs and things like that. And, yeah, usually it just, uh, it's just straightforward. I get I pay 15 bucks, I get, like, a 10-minute back massage. So, but the other day he was on, like, Lexington and 63rd, which is a sort of um, unfamiliar territory... <laughs> And uh, having some time between jobs, he thought, you know, I'll just go into one of these back massage places. I'll get a, a quick back massage, and I'll, and I'll get to my second job. And uh, so the first thing you noticed when you went in there was instead of the standard sort of older 
Asian woman, um, conservatively dressed, was a was a very young, like Korean girl. What was she wearing? Um, hardly anything. <laughs> A very low-cut T-shirt and extremely short, tight jean shorts. So, but you asked her for a back massage, and she took you... What did she say? She took you to a bathroom. Well, yeah, I I walked in, and I said, confused... Like, I was already confused, but too disoriented to make sense of my environment, or put it all together. And so I walked in, and I said, back rub? (laughs) And she said, bathroom. And I said, no, back rub. And then she still was convinced that I was saying bathroom, so it took me to the bathroom so quickly that I was still unable to, like, communicate what I really wanted that, in that moment. So I was just standing there at the bathroom entrance with her. And, yeah. And, and so it, it, it took until three other young Korean girls dressed exactly the same came into the room and for the main girl to say, one hour, $70, yeah. for Evan to realize that he'd walked in on a Korean prostitution ring. Wow. Yeah. And so... <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a so. Okay. Well, no, no, no. I mean, yeah, so I walked in and I, yeah, I was trying to, I really just want, I didn't want to, well, first of all, I didn't have an hour to spare. <laughs> oh, that's, that's the first thing. <laughs> the first yeah. thing. So, but before I put it together, I was like, oh, I can't do, I can't be here for an hour. And she's like, no 30 minutes, just hour, $70, which is like significantly more expensive than I've seen massages at other places in the city. Um, and then, well, and you, you were on 63rd in Lexington. But, yes, yeah, so I was so naive. I, I didn't put anything together, um, any of that together at the moment. And when once she said that, she stuck to the hour. Then it hit me. I was like, oh, I need to get the fuck out of here. I'm in, I'm in a like you know a prostitution uh, center. Center. A center for prostitution. <laughs> center for prostitution. Um, yeah. Yeah, a brothel, if you will. But uh, yeah, so it's still they're still out there. Um, <laughs> Right, right in the heart of Manhattan. How did the interaction go when you left? Were they, oh, I were just, they, oh yeah, they, sorry. Were they angry? No, no. Once I yeah, once it happened, I was once I realized what was going on. I was just like, oh yeah, I need to get out of here. So I said, all right, thank you, and then I just I just walked out the door, and I was just I was so confused for a minute and felt yeah. How's your back? It still hurts. Okay. Uh, welcome, Bear. Welcome, to Snacky Tunes. Uh, I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, let's take it back. Let's go to Gainesville. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what do you miss about Gainesville? The swamp, and not, I don't mean the football stadium. Although that's what I, I miss that, that but that's not what I'm talking about. I mean the the humidity and the alligators. Do you really miss that? Yeah, absolutely. It's, I, uh, you I know, mean, it's, you're wearing a sweater and a beanie, so I'm just curious. Like, you look very adapted to like a northern cold. Well, yeah. This is pretty fashionable in Gainesville too, though. You know, it's <laughs> kind of a <laughs> College town. Uh, how did you guys make your way from uh, Gainesville up to New York? By car. Mm. Um, Personally, per- we we each moved up here either for work or for school. And being the the uh, musicians that we are, we were hungry to put together a band when we moved up here. And since we all knew each other from Florida, it was uh, it was easy to get it rolling. <laughs> Um, and so you guys didn't come up together until you formed here uh, just independently? Correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, what year was that? That was at the uh, sort of winter 2010, 2011. Like, we were all holed up in our apartments. That was a really bad year for blizzards, I think. I remember. Yeah, and um, that's when we got things going. I'm a big uh, believer that the winter in New York probably spans like a million creative projects that just kind of get washed away come summer but if you can kind of make the hump between winter to winter (laughs) you have like a chance to actually do something um speaking of anything let's uh let's hear a song yeah uh we're gonna play a song called main m-a-n-e yeah you have two spellings right yeah we have we have a uh we have an a side and a b side of the same seven inch main and main um the former being the song we're about to play and the latter being spelled like main the state okay uh this is not main the state All right, conveyor live on Snacky Tunes. One, two, 
too He's thinking about those greenish colored eyes Are on the first of every wet and humbled head Ashamed of love I'm serious man, I can't stop feeling Going out naked, nature thin Coming on home to sand and water Lamb and slaughter First of holiday time and making pie Something I wish I'd ever told you Is flying on planes, I'd like to hold you And nerves like never justify the feeling inside The first of many old worries And it's worth it to me To skate around the bad times And all the little feelings someone's heart and how do i dare not take it apart cause thumbs and knuckles all are white with innocence bite the first of typical sign of dark night what do i say if taking my time means rushing all the wrong things i'd rather you take my main and deal with the bucking and fucking up again because it's worth it Wonderful. I wish there was. I always wish there was more people so like the applause because nothing sounds worse than a one person applauding. Oh well, Matt and I can applaud. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh, and there's some there there. Um, Thank you, everybody. Yeah. No problem. Uh, thank you. Good night. Uh, so, I was. I forgot to ask, but uh, is there any food from Gainesville that you miss that is not necessarily done up here? Uh, Where to begin? A Cuban place called Flacos. That's Let's just a, say Cuban sandwiches in general. It, Cuban sandwiches. It, are they, is it just not the same up here? Yeah, once you yeah. get this far from Miami or Cuba, I guess, <laughs> they just start tasting different. They're not as buttery. Is, uh, that, is that really the main difference? I, I, You know, I feel like the Cuban sandwiches down there, they were just like, they were drippy and sloppy and, and, and decadent and... and delicious and yeah, here the, they're like the cuban sandwiches up here are like they have a gourmet sort of very clean cut like sprig of arugula <laughs> on the side sort of feel yeah uh my friend was um teaching me some spanish dishes and i was like are you sure that's how much olive oil we're supposed to use <laughs> and she was like americans always say that they always say too looks like it too much this is how our dishes are made it just looks swimming and that's why it tastes so good you just need to deal with it and I'm guessing yeah. it's something similar to You worry about the I health effects it. later. Yeah. I mean, uh, is there anything else besides Cuban sandwiches that you guys... Uh... Evan. I mean, <laughs> there was a Mexican restaurant there. I mean, but that's there's plenty of that in New York, Bar- to be fair. Yeah. Yeah, barbecue as well. But my favorite place was La Tienda, which is yeah. just a great Mexican <clears throat> restaurant. Really? What, what was your thing there? Um, I used to get these vegetarian uh, the enchiladas with the green sauce. 
Oh man. Oh yeah. So good. It was the it was the best like verde enchilada sauce we've ever had. Uh, do you guys cook as a band or do you guys? Yeah, we we've yeah. been trying to cook more and more. I I really love to cook and I had gotten out of the habit, but during uh, the hurricane, we were you know stuck inside. So it it was a uh, it took a hurricane to motivate me to start cooking again. <laughs> And Alan and I were enjoying cooking a lot of things throughout that week. So, but yeah. Any what was the highlight? Hurricane highlight. Um, <laughs> the hurricane highlight. Wow. I the pork butt. Way. I'm just gonna jump in and say we roasted a pork oh, butt yeah. like an all day sort of in the oven roast, and uh, and we made our own sort of home style South Carolina barbecue sauce. Oh. Which though we're from Florida, I would say that South Carolina style is my favorite barbecue. Same. Texas um, for me. Texas barbecue is my favorite. Yeah? I just like the mustard. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the pork butt, I think, was a highlight. For How sure. did you serve it? Shredded, pulled, if you will, and <laughs> then on the whitest, bleachiest, sesame seediest <laughs> buns that we could find. Just, like, totally bad, pasteurized, yeah. like, could survive, like, two years on the <laughs> shelf. No mold, no nothing. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Just soaked up everything and still... And then I think we did, um, like, collards and french fries and baked beans, and we had a whole sort of barbecue day. Did you guys write any music while you were waiting out the, uh, the storm? Did we, I don't think we necessarily wrote anything, but we did a lot of yeah. recording yeah. and um, jamming. And, yeah, we never lost power, so it was hard to get away from the TV and the Internet. Right. <laughs> I mean, it, it was, we were commenting earlier that, like, I also live in the area, and, like, you would never know here that a few miles away, like, except for the oh, yeah. was, like, devastation, and still yeah. devastation. Um, but, uh, it, for, like, the other, for the thing, it's just, like, it's crazy how, just depending on your elevation in the city, it, it didn't really, uh, it changed so much. Yeah. Which is, which is crazy. Um, so you guys have a new record. Newish record. Mm-hmm. So we'll say July is still new. Yeah, new record. Um, out on, out and uh, wanted to. How did that come to be? From you know making your own, EPs and everything to uh, finding a label. Well, <laughs> the story of finding a label. <laughs> Go. Uh, well, I wasn't really. I wasn't even there when we when we were introduced to Paper Garden Records. <clears throat> but um, we yeah we we put out a couple EPs uh, and and singles and whatnot on our own um and then i guess played a cmj show where we met the wonderful folks of paper garden records and we gave them one of our bright orange vinyls that caught their attention they gave it a spin and the rest is history in the making i don't that's <laughs> it it's just that simple uh I, yeah i mean we ha- we shared so a lot of uh, beer and conversations you know, it's kind of like you're dating someone when when a, a band is, uh, you know, looking to start a relationship with the with a label to help produce something. But um, once once that sort of happened, we we spent several months recording and writing uh, what came to be the record. I think it was like an eight month project uh, before it was eventually done record be, done being recorded in. Uh, March and I- April ish, mm-hmm. right? And then it we released it in July, um, and which I think speaks to our sort of um, mentality with regard to releasing music because that's that's so quick. The more I think about it, from like the day that we finished it and like locked it in until the day we released it was just like maybe two months time. Yeah, and I think as a band. We're, that's that's just how we think. We're like, okay, this is done. It has to be. We have to get it out there because we have to move on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. That's sort of what we're doing right now. We're working on the next thing. I mean, let's let's remind the listeners that you said you formed in 2010, 2011. So which is yeah, 2012. So it's really not yeah. that not that far back. Um, let's hear another song. Sure. Um, this is going to be another song on the record called Muckraker. Mark Raker, are you so?
All right. Yeah. You almost got me on like that false, <clears throat> that false landing. I almost took the mic back. Yeah. Um, so to good. Throw in a lot of gotchas. In our, <laughs> in our what's our? How many gotcha moments is this song gonna have? Uh, what's the average gotcha moment for song? I want to say like three or four. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was a, a that was nothing. But even <laughs> that one had some hidden gotchas. What's yeah, it? Just like, a meter in the verses is a gotcha. Oh, really? It gets us. Gets me sometimes. <laughs> really? You're like, I know I wrote this and I was there, <laughs> but I keep falling for the same goddamn joke. Um, so you guys are on to the next uh, recording cycle, but I mean, have you taken time for tours? Been out on the road? For sure. Taken that car that took you from Gainesville <laughs> elsewhere? <laughs> oh yeah, well we've upgraded to a to a twelve passenger van. So very nice. We're very nice. We're we're road ready. Um, did you guys head out at all uh, this summer? Where yeah, did you guys hit pretty much the entire month of July. Nice. We were we were <coughs> circling the country counterclockwise. <laughs> okay, I got it. Yeah, from New York, counterclockwise. A little zigzagging, back and forthing. Back Any and uh, and forthing. unexpected highlights? Fort Wayne, Indiana. Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, a actually, city this and is a, a good story. <laughs> um, so there's this massage parlor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we make sure to try them all out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've never heard of Fort Wayne before, but it's a college town. I think they have like an art school there. And this was in the middle of the summer, the sort of like second week of July. And in New York, it was 108 degrees. In Chicago, it was 108 degrees. Elsewhere, it was 108 degrees, <laughs> including Fort Wayne, Indiana. And it might have been it, 109. It was pretty hot there. It could have been 109 or 10. But it was so <clears throat> hot that day that the town had lost power or two okay. two thirds of the town had yeah. lost power and we we happened to be playing in the only bar in the one third of town that still had power so um we roll up to this uh roll up to this bar i think evan had a heat stroke in the back of the van because we lost our air conditioning that same day and uh all of a sudden it starts filling up and then five or six hours later at two o'clock in the morning when we're supposed to play it's just like packed in there because people are trying to get out of the heat and not go to bed because it's too hot to sleep and uh it was a great show yeah that's so crazy uh and did you well i mean did you have uh people come up to you? it's like you know i came in because it was hot but man i'm really glad yeah that i yeah. did yeah and we, and we played really late we went on after 1 a.m and and it was still packed after we were done wait what time was do bars close in fort wayne I want to say we know. were there till like 3 or 3.30. They were really rocking the AC. I think they had to. I think yeah. if they had shut it down, there would have been a riot. Right. So, like, I mean, did people kind of, like, sway when they watched <laughs> you guys? Like, no one, like, was obviously <laughs> jumping around. They kind of were just, like, moving back and forth. There was forth. actually more people jumping around at that show than maybe any of our other shows. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Did For- they, they doubled down on the heat? <laughs> they, they, were, uh, they were doing it in Fort Wayne. They were dancing. They were really yeah. dancing. I mean, who? Uh, shout out to your booking agent. Who's your booking agent? Uh, Alan, mostly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys still book all your own shows? We do. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, why that route as opposed to uh, a booking agent? It's a great question. It is a good question. I don't. I mean, there's there's really no answer other than it's the only option we have right now. Oh. Yeah. What do they? Um, there's a phrase for that sort of thing. Not necessary evil, but it, it was like a necessity. It just necessitated that we book our own shows because. I think at the time that we were planning our tour, yeah, we, the album hadn't wasn't even, out yet. we hadn't even put our album out, so we still right. had a very low profile. Um, but we knew that if we wanted to tour for 40 days, we were going to have to start booking it like five or six months in advance. So we just, Alan and Evan, Alan really took the lead and just started doing it on his own, contacting other bands in other cities. And then before I knew it, we were booking some like really nice venues and some really good um sort of like radio appearances and we did day trotter while we were on the road love day trotter yeah um, shout out shout out shout out to sean, yeah, sean. Mueller. um i never met him in real life <laughs> uh we did npr or we were on npr while we were on the road it, it just turned into, it just blossomed into this really nice sort of homegrown tour now did you take 10 percent <laughs> uh no i did not <laughs> we'll talk afterwards right <laughs> um but that's i mean and also like the thing about that is, like you also own it in a way that you know the people i mean you know it's tough you know from a band perspective i was like no one wants to talk money just because they like want to show up and like oh i don't know but if you can kind of own that it's like a much more experience because it's a long relationship and like right. that's why you know for like you and i speaking about booking this show it's like hey man we've been speaking for a few months really happy to have you here yeah um 
you know, I, I kind of like that cutting out the middle person for as... Yeah, as long know, as you can. As long as you can. Yeah. I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not too anxious to do it all over again. Yeah, no, I... No, <laughs> but it was a good experience. Yeah. And we kind of had to pay our dues, I think. You know, we had to prove that we could that we could do that and, t- and we could support our, our whole tour on our yeah. own before people would give us a sort of uh, credibility or time of day even um, to, you know, prove that when we go back, we can, we can do it again if, uh, just as good, if not better. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I think that uh, booking agents and PR people play a very important role, especially as bands get bigger and they just run out of time to focus on touring and writing music. But I think when bands are starting out, it's like so important just to connect with people and not have someone else do it for you because, uh, no one's going to be more excited about you than yourself. Sure, yeah. And then sure. you can hire in the people as like the, you know, you get bigger. So, um, yeah. well, I want to thank you guys for coming. Cause I want to make sure we get one more song and, um, want to give me the nuts and bolts of where you can buy the record, how to find you guys, how to hit up <laughs> Alan so he can book you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Boise, get at him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can find the record on conveyor.bandcamp.com, which, uh, we're still using as a great resource. It's bands. really, really good. Um, you can also find it on papergardenrecords.com if you want to sort of pretend that we're like a, a really, really legit band and we go through our label. Um, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook if you do all the right Googling. Um, what were the other questions? We're playing next at 285 Kent on Thursday, November 29th. Um, so you can see our live sort of... Uh, it's different. I mean, I played uh, a track from you guys in the opening. It's more synths. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is our strip down set. No, and it, it, yeah. I mean it's awesome. I like it. And um, let me just say, thanks to Brian, thanks to Heidi, thank you to Heidi, sure. who forwarded over the uh, email, which is again people that kind of get in there. So what are you guys gonna? Oh, before I close you out, let me close this out. Um, thank you all for listening. Uh, reminder: Snacky Tunes Live Volume Three. If most of you are getting this on the podcast, is up now. If you're listening live, it's out tomorrow. You can go to heritageradionetwork.org or fotpnyc.com um, or you can just kind of Google uh, Heritage Radio Network Snacky Tune SoundCloud um, the comp is free it features Reggie Waltz Wallpaper Spento Band Dragonet Computer Magic Erica from Alvar Simone and a tons more um, and tomorrow night uh, on the 13th we are doing a Red Hook Initiative benefit at Cameo Gallery at North Six and Wythe we have X Cops nice. Erica Spring Moon Hooch all playing live DJ sets by Computer Magic and Rewards. Um, $5 donation or more at the door. 10% of the bar all goes to the Red Hook Initiative. Please go out and volunteer. Um, the mess is not cleaned up and far from it. So even if you're hearing this a month from now, please go out. People still need help. Check, Make sure you're giving to good places. Donate some winter clothes. Beanies are acceptable. Thanks. Um, and uh, Conveyor, thank you so much. Matt Burns, I'm going to drink your salsa when this is done. And, um, Whoa. yeah, hey, that's how it goes in Snacky Tunes. And uh, we will be off next week um, going home to Philadelphia to celebrate Thanksgiving. My mom was already making pies. Oh, and uh, we will be nice. back in a couple of weeks with more episodes of Snacky Tunes. What are you guys going to take us out with? We're going to, speaking of moms, we're going to play a song um, that's about talking to your mother about um, sort of important things. So the song is called Mom Talk. Training went to an island off so I took my swimming trunks and a book of love words I rode my bike and sang songs onto the boardwalk I opened up my throat and I will not forget to send a photo of Put on a pack of jacket to walk a mile I opened every throat and made love in nature Said sorry son it's gone away, we were not scared I might have turned my phone off, I might have tried to I might have hurt my ankle, I might have tried to I might have eaten something, I might have tried to I might have taken off but heaven didn't come and I was earth and sun Away 
and my friends were too. I was away and my friends were too. I was away and my friends were too. I was away and my friends were too. I was away and my friends were too. I was away and my friends were too. I was away and my friends were too. I was away and my friends were too. to talk about today hey mom hey mom hey mom hey mom hey mom hey mom what do you want to talk about today hey mom hey mom hey mom hey mom hey mom hey mom what do you want to talk about today hey mom hey mom hey mom hey mom hey mom hey mom what do you want to talk about today Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening.